home. That was awesome. I love you guys so much. Hey, thank you. Are y'all excited about the word tonight? Would you stand and give honor to whom honor is due? And please make welcome Brother Paris Stone. Hello, thank you. Uh, I just realized something, and I hate to distract. Your your microphone is totally red at the top. Can you see that? This is totally brown. Would you tell Karen to quit wearing makeup? Because <laughs> that's lipstick, probably, and I know you don't wear it. This is makeup, and unless I'm hey, on TV, Stone, I don't wear it. Yeah. Your mic says Karen. Oh. Oh my goodness, it okay. does. She's watching right now. Karen, we're banning makeup for you. <laughs> and she says back, she says back, that's what you think. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just realized that. And so uh, Mandy or uh, Ashley, whoever, we need to get these cleaned really because I'm looking, that's pretty. Look at it. That look, that... Help me somebody. Huh? I, mean, I mean, let's help the preacher right now. We're going we're gonna to get these clean. Uh, thank you for being here. It's been a great attendance. I don't know if you were there on Sunday night at the first, uh, what we call revival through the lens of a camera. It was packed out. We had chair, brought chairs out. The parking lot ran out of space. And the service was wonderful. And I'm looking forward to a time. Now, we still pray with people, but I'm looking forward to a time when we can go back to the days of having prayer lines again, you know, and laying hands on people and that type of thing. So, so uh, that's really what uh, over in the past, a lot of things have been built on the moving of the spirit in our meetings, conferences. So we're looking forward to that time as well. Uh, we do want to uh, thank you for being here. So many of you, how many of you uh, live in the Cleveland area, Bradley County, raise your hands. Let's see all the, oh my. Okay. That's a good majority. How many live outside of Bradley County? somewhere. Uh, yeah, a lot of you folks that come here live outside of Bradley County. Well, thank you for joining us. And I want to also uh, greet our audience that may be watching right now. And I had a message that I actually had prepared. I've had this prepared for about five days and sitting uh, at the house trying to watch a two-year-old grandbaby. <laughs> pop, pop, nap, 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 pop, pop, nap. So I go to lay her down to take her nap and she closes her eyes like she's sleeping and then she starts flipping like a frog, croaking like a frog, acting like she's a frog. So the last uh, two hours of my life have been very interesting to say the least. I will stay at, at the office next time to study for the, re, the message instead of going home. But uh, we, we <laughs> Pam knows what I'm talking about. But I, I found a note. I found a note on a scratched out on a yellow uh, pad. And the spirit of the Lord just began to deal with me about sharing with you this message and putting part of my heart of some things I see, some things I discern happening uh, as it relates to the church or to the body of Christ. Now, so many people at this time would have us share with you about the United States or America or in the prophetic realm. I mean, I can't tell you the number of people that we hear from every day who are interested in that subject, including people who do not go to church, people that have never never been interested in these type of things. And it's amazing. We have people in government positions, uh, state positions, Kremlin positions, Israeli Knesset that keep up with what we're saying. And I'm grateful for that. I'm very humbled and very grateful that the Lord has opened up that door. However, I do feel like that tonight we need a word for the actual body of Christ. And so we're going to go to the book of Ruth. And I will tell you that this will not be a long message. If you came thinking I was preaching 70 minutes, uh, I will not. Of course, I have said that 300 times in this building before, and it just didn't work out that way. But my plan is to get to the point, to give you some word studies, to give you some patterns in these word studies to help you understand something. Now, I want to go back to something that I have taught here many times, and it's a principle that Solomon uh, spoke of in Ecclesiastes.
Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10. The thing which has been is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. And then he repeats it in chapter 3 again, where he talks about the things that have happened in the past are going to repeat themselves in the future. Now we know that from three examples. As it was in the days of Noah, it will be in the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Example number two, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Example number three is that there was a Babel and a Babylon in the Old Testament and there is a mystery Babylon, same word, same phrase, in the Apocalypse in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Now, we often call these repetitive patterns types and shadows. In other words, or some call it an anti-type. In other words, what you see written will repeat itself in detail to the minute detail if it's found in Scripture and the same pattern is revealed in Scripture. See, we're not living in Scripture. We're living in prophetic times. But we can't say we're living in the era of of uh, the ministry of Jesus or the ministry of the apostles. That's past. So here's an example. Abraham goes to Mount Moriah. He takes his only son, Isaac, and he puts the wood on his shoulder. He lays him on the wood to offer him. What's, the, what's, the, what's that type and shadow about or antitype about, whatever you want to call it? Here's what it's about. Jesus goes to Mount Moriah, carries the cross up to the top of the mountain with the help of a man from Africa. He's laid on that cross. And here's the interesting thing. Ready? In the story of Abraham and Isaac, Isaac got up and Jesus got up. That's the part that's often left out. Now, that is an example of a type and shadow. There are other examples that we call prophetic imagery. And that is to say that a story in the Bible or even entire books or chapters will give you a hint or a clue of what is going to happen in a, in a time frame in the future that's going to repeat itself with those exact same pictures and images. I can go, for example, uh, th here's your little message. I can go to the story of Eve, and I can tell you there are three sons mentioned. You have Cain, you have his brother Abel, and when Cain killed Abel, you had a third son named Seth that replaced Abel. Now, Cain's offering was bloodless. In other words, his sacrifice had no blood involved. Abel's offering was an offering of blood, totally. And Seth's name in Hebrew means appointed. It's someone that replaces someone, and they're appointed as a replacement. You can take the three levels of churches today with those three sons. You have the bloodless church. The, John Kilpatrick went to a church out west to preach and they told him don't preach against sin, don't talk about speaking in tongues, don't preach on, uh, uh, don't preach on the blood because it offends people. That's a bloodless church. And I've got news for you. You take out the blood, you take out redemption, you take out redemption, the whole church is going to hell. You take the whole plan of God out, the whole plan of salvation. So that's the Cain type of church. Then you have the Abel type of church. What's the Abel type of church? He pays the price because he has a blood offering. He preaches on the blood. You overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. And so that means the church that believes in the power of the redeeming blood of Christ. That's the true church. And then you have the church that Seth, whose Hebrew name means appointed, and that's your person purpose-driven people. In other words, that's, that's, that's maybe a good message that may have some good things about it, but we're not to be people who just focus on a program. We are not to be people, as you have learned, that focuses on personalities. We are to be people who focuses on the power of Almighty God to change lives. So, there's the, so, so what we're going to do in the next few moments is we're going to take the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth has about four chapters. Check me out and see if I'm right there, if my memory's right. I'm going from memory. Four chapters. You have a dakes and I have a dakes. Look, mine is, mine is red and 
yours is black. What about that? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Just different like different covers. Yeah, just like our mics. There's a sign. Oh, it's a sign. Let me figure it out. Okay. Now, in the book of Ruth, this is probably one of the greatest stories that gets taught less than any narrative in the entire Bible. But women love this book. Now, we found out something. Let me give you some statistics about women because the women, we're going to focus in on three different women and we're going to show you the imagery of what they represent and how it relates to us today, okay? That's where we're going to go. But did you know that when it comes to Christian products, 85% of the women are the purchasers. Only 15% of the men purchase, on an average, Christian books in a bookstore. It is not men, it is women. Talk to me women. Come on, help me women here. We found out, for example, on my YouTube channel, 55% of the people watching my videos are women and 45% of the people watching our videos are men. We could take you through the manifest telecast. 70% of those that respond to a manifest offer are women. 30% are men. So my question for you is, is this the reason why men are so dumb? I was, I was waiting for one woman, to, one woman to say yes, and I got an amen right there. No, men are not dumb, but here's the thing. Men are picture-oriented. Men would rather for you to tell them the story and just get to the bottom line. How many women know what I'm talking about? Your husband come home from work, you want to talk to him about something, and he talks in grunts. Huh? Yeah. Well. What? Huh? Mm, yeah. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't talk in full sentences. Can, can anybody bear witness with me? Pam, raise your hand over there. You know what I'm saying? Pam's, Pam's got half a hand up, so she's half in agreement with me on this. But, but the point is that women will understand, and I'm not saying the men won't, and men don't get offended at me at what I just said. I'm cutting up with you. You should know by now I cut up every now and then. So get your little smiley faces back on, fellas. It's all good. It's all good. So what I want to tell you is, when we're going to deal with three women. Now, here are here is basically the story in a nutshell. There is a woman by the name of Naomi who has a husband by the name of Elimelech. Elimelech means God is king in Hebrew. And they have two boys by the name of Mahalon and Kilion. And those names are really weird names. I have never met two kids in my life by those names in the history of the world except right there. Now, the reason you probably do not have those names used today almost anywhere is that one name means sickly and the other name means to pine and wither away. So in other words, they are born. They may have been twins. We don't know. That's a speculation. But they were sick when they were born and they carried this sickness with them. Now, both of these men ended up married, but both of these men, including Naomi's husband, all ended up dying. And so this is part of the narrative of this story. Now, let's begin with something very practical. We open up the book of Ruth by introducing Naomi, Elimelech, Mechelon, and Kilion, and we open up the book with this idea. And there was a famine in those days in the land of Bethlehem. Now, Bet, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Bethlehem is in the area of the tribal land grant of the tribe of Judah. Judah is praised or praise. So let's just break it down that the house of bread represents the church. The house of bread, this is where you're fed. This is where you come to be ministered to. So this is like Bethlehem. This is the, your house of bread. Jesus, the bread come down from heaven. You eat of him. You drink. Uh, you, you know, he even said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, which nobody understood. But that simply means have intimacy with me. Have communion with me. Fellowship with me. So we have the church represented by Bethlehem. Then we discover that, that it is located in the tribe that we, we know as Judah, and Judah is praised. So what should be occurring in the house of, of bread or in the house of God should be people being fed, people receiving from God, and people worshiping 
the Lord. So it's supposed to be a house of worship and a house of praise and a house where needs are met by the teaching and preaching of the word. How many of you agree that's the purpose of the church? Raise your hand and wave it. That's why we are here in, our, in this community tonight called Ramp Community. Now, it's odd, and I want, I want you to track with me because I'm going to throw this into a different twist in about two minutes. It is odd that there is a famine in the house of bread. Now, what causes a famine? And the answer is a lack of rain. When there is no rain, it produces a drought. When a drought is produced, the seed will not mature, neither will the fruit be on the vine. So what is happening here is a drought has come, a famine has come, and the people are getting very concerned in the house of bread because things ain't like they used to be. I remember when I would go to the barley fields and I'd just get all kinds of barley, and I could go to the wheat field and I could get all, I'm going to do this like I want, and I can get all kinds of wheat, but I'm telling you it's so dry now that you can't get no barley and you can't get no wheat and it's so dry that even the springs are beginning to dry up. Stop right there because now you have to make your decision and your decision will be I will wait out the famine. I will stay in the house of bread. I will stay in a place where nobody's praising if I have to praise myself. And I'm going to hang in there and I'm going to hang on till this famine is over. Now, here's the interesting part. There was a man who did that who was related to Elimelech. It's his brother and his name is Boaz. Track with me for just a minute. He don't show up till later on in the book. He don't show up till Naomi comes back with Ruth. But do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that he did not leave Bethlehem. He did not cross over to the muddy Jordan River to the sides of Moab and live with the Moabites for 10 years because he was disappointed because there was a famine because he was sad because nobody was praising he stayed exactly where he was and his attitude was Bethlehem is my place this is my city these are my people we have we've we've gone through hell before and we'll make it through hell again we've had trouble come before we'll make it through trouble again famine's not the first time it's come here so what we're going to do we're going to hang on and believe God that the famine one day is going to break and the water's going to flow and the grain's coming back. Somebody needs to have a Boaz spirit on them that believe that God is in charge of things even when it looks like a famine. So he stays. Now, I don't know who was in charge of this bunch of <laughs> four but they go to Moab. Now you have to understand something about the Moabite guys. The Moabites, according to the law of Moses, were the people who made Israel sin through Balaam with a bunch of girls committing fornication. The Moabites are those that God had to send a plague to Israel because of what they did and kill about 25,000 men. So the Moabites, are you still here? The Moabites have caused real problems for the Israelites. But watch this, when you've hit a famine, when things aren't going right, I'm going to show you in Ruth, what, I'm going to show you what Naomi said. And when God hadn't treated you fair, it's real strange what kind of company you'll keep. Because normally they would never go live in the land of Moab. But the, the Israelis have a saying the Israelis have a very strange saying, and I've, I've used this in messages before. They will say to them, why are you negotiating with those people? Those people don't like the Jews, but those people also really are afraid of, let's say, the Persians. So Israel will negotiate with those people even though they're afraid of the Persians because the enemy of my enemy has become my friend. Thank you. Let me preach where Jake said it's good. I'll preach to Jake right here. So maybe the rest of you will pick it up in a minute. So in other words, they are enemies of one another. There is, no, there is no love between them. 
So Naomi and and Elimelech and their two sons go to a land where they really are going to be uncomfortable there as Jews because of the history that they have together. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Therefore, I'm offended at God. Read what Naomi said. God has mistreated me. God has... God has let my family die. All this bad's happened to me. So I'll just go and have, it's the same principle when David, when he left Judah and he went down there and started hanging around the land of the Philistines and he picked a Philistine city named Ziglag to live in and the armies came in and took everything they had and burnt the city down and captured their wives. You know what the problem was? He had no business being in Ziglag. That was, that was the territory of an enemy an enemy of God and an enemy of Israel and the enemy of his own people. And yet he's hanging around with the enemies just because he's upset of how God's treated him. I'm going to preach this to somebody what's for it's over with. We're mad at the Lord. All right. Now, when they get there, these two boys must have had something going for them. Or maybe they heard <laughs> that they were uh, that their daddy was a wealthy landowner back in Israel. We don't know. Hello, some people marry for different reasons. <laughs> you, ladies, help me, ladies. You okay? You you should know that. I mean, I hear you know you've heard you hear that your whole life. Maybe they maybe they thought okay these are rich boys. One day they'll go back home. I don't know what their motive was, but they both get married, and one marries a woman named Orpha. Orpah, and the other marries a woman named Ruth. And it's right here in the Bible. Now, both men die. So now Naomi's lost her husband and she's in Moab. No family left because her two sons are now dead. The only thing she's got left are two daughter-in-laws. Now, the two daughter-in-laws are interesting because let's go through the name of the three women and we're going to break this down in just a moment to the body of Christ. There are three women in the story and they represent the three types of churches, especially that I've seen in the Western Hemisphere in the United States. Naomi's name in Hebrew means pleasant, pleasant. She's a nice person to be around. She's a kind person. She's a caring person. She's a giving person. Then the name Orpah is very, very interesting because Orpah's name (laughs) means neck. But if you take certain roots of her name, it can almost mean a neck that's twisted or a neck that's stiff. Orph. (laughs) Now, the third... (laughs) You've heard that name, haven't you? Then the third name is Ruth. And Ruth is, Ruth's name, there's several different meaning, meanings to it, but Ruth is one who assists, one who helps, one who has compassion toward others in need. And again, I'm giving you a really broad definition here of what these three names are, okay, in, in, in the languages. So we have something interesting going on in America right now. A recent survey from one of the Christian research organizations has said this, that in the United States at this moment, every person who is a member of a church actually has three churches they attend. Now, we know that when, when people have moved here to Omega Center International, Some attend Judy's, some attend Kevin Wallace's, some attend South Cleveland, some attend North Cleveland, some some attend uh, Jimmy's church because we were not a Sunday congregation and most people that have moved here that ever went to church traditionally go to church on a Sunday and we said that Tuesday night is your inspiration night, your revival center night, your Holy Ghost night, your get fed in the middle of the week night. So that's what it was about. So we understand that. But what is interesting I have friends here tonight that I'll say, what you up to? Well, we're going to so-and-so's church this Sunday. What you up to? Well, we decide to go to so-and-so. Come on. 
Now, I'm not saying that to condemn anybody. I'm saying that's the now statistic that everybody in the United States who goes to a Christian church, that there is a, I mean, the percentage is like 70%. It's the most, it's very high that has three churches they choose from at any given time. Now, the danger of that is that when one preacher makes you mad, you got two more you can go to. I guess that's a positive for you. I don't know. Then if that preacher makes you mad, you got one left you can go to. Then if that one makes you mad, you know what you'll do? You go start, you'll start your own group. You'll start, you know, you'll go, you'll go out and get your three or four, your 10 or 20, however many you got, who believe like you and think like you, and you'll start your own group. Now, let me say something about this thing of starting your own group, because I'm a pastor's son, and I'm an evangelist for 45 years, and I can tell you a few things if you pay attention. I kept noticing in my travels years ago, this is a little humorous, but it's serious, but I kept noticing in my travels years ago, and I'll tell you where it really pointed out to me was my wife's home church in Northport, Alabama. Alabama had like 400 and, I don't want to get the number wrong, 400 and some Church of God congregations. It's one of the largest Church of God states for single individual congregations in the Church of God, that in Georgia. But the overseer, M.H. Kennedy, said to me in 19, about 80, I think it was, he said, I have changed pastors in 250 churches in a year. And I said, what is going on? He said, the average church of God, and I'm not picking on the church of God. I know all you church of God folks get to manifest it on me when I say stuff like this. But, but this is what he told me. He says, in the Alabama, state of Alabama, in the church of God, the average pastor stays 18 months. And then he leaves. Now, I got to preaching this later. I said, what would happen to you as far as your maturity and your stability if you change daddies every 18 months? You're a married woman, you have five children. You get married for 18 months, he's real hard, real conservative, they go to bed on time, they gotta go to school, you divorce him and get a daddy that lets him stay up all night. Then you don't like him because he's too lenient, so you divorce him and 18 months later, you get another daddy. And here's what would happen, those churches would have a daddy that loved the redback hymnal and everybody came up and they liked that. Well, the next daddy comes in and says, we're doing away with those old songs, we're gonna sing off the screen. And he made all those folks mad. So then that daddy got a new group of people who liked the screens. And then all of a sudden that daddy left and they got a daddy that had a family singing group, 12 kids and all all of them could sing and play instruments. So the next thing you know, they're on the platform and the choir's gone and the praise team is gone and they're all upset. But all those people that like Southern gospel, four part, eight part, 12 part harmony, they showed up because they got the greatest singing down there I've ever heard. Well, that daddy stays 18 months and then here comes a daddy that can't even preach. Then another daddy, he leaves after 18 months. How, how functional or dysfunctional would your family be if as a woman, for example, you you changed husbands every 18 months and you did it for 10 years and that might be the reason the church is so messed up. Because everybody's got their favorite daddy. And often it's the spiritual dad that you were saved under or blessed under. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul had spiritual sons, Timothy, for example. Nothing wrong with that until you begin to feel like that if your daddy ain't preaching, you ain't coming. No, no, no. <laughs> Just kidding. You do whatever you want to do. <laughs> if I break it, I have to pay for it. You know, I have a fund, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you. Now, am I telling the truth? So we've got dysfunctional Christians that are very confused. I don't blame them. I blame the fact they've had no stability in leadership. All right. Preach on, Perry. I'm going to. You ready? Here we go. So, oh, I could go three different directions. Somebody pray for the preacher. Somebody pray for the preacher right now. Pray for the preacher. Pray for the preacher. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing some things. Give me just a minute because I want to make sure I stay in the flow and not get in my flow. Okay. Now, Pam's church. Here's the story. I noticed that in the area of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, there were 11 church of gods. Buell was one of them. 
and I don't, and there was a couple in Tuscaloosa, there's a couple in Northport in, that, in the area. And they were actually good churches, people that love God. So I ask, how did you get this many churches? And the answer was, all of them had one mother church, right, Pam? And then they would have a church split with about 10 people getting mad. And those 10 would go over there and start a church. Then that church would build to 100, 150, and 25 of them would get mad. I'm telling the true story now. I'm telling the true story. And every church in that area, and I was, now remember, this is years ago. It may not be this way now. But every church in that area, with the exception of one, just about had started out of a church split. So here's what I noticed. Because I used to get these papers in Virginia. It was called the Virginian and in Alabama. It was uh, Echoes maybe. But anyway, what happened was it would give you the listing of that church, how many members it had, Sunday school attendance. Did anybody ever see those years ago? Uh, YPE, <laughs> you can tell how old I am, <laughs> or the Wednesday night service. And it would give you general information. And so people could say, oh, look, you know, they're, they're growing. Well, they're not growing. And here's the thing. And it happened in Virginia, where I was from, and it happened in Alabama. I noticed after 10 years, the churches that split off were running the same or less. They, Come on. they never grew. And I will go back to Floyd Lahan, what Floyd said about it. Floyd said, what happens when you cut a person's arm off? What happens to the arm when you sever it from the, from the body? And Floyd said, the answer is the body survives, but the arm dies. Because what happens is this, and I'm, I'm saying this because this is all a part of the Ruth story that we're talking about that we're going to get into. I'm saying this, that when people are, as we're going to show you Ruth was, when they do things because of anger or bitterness, they will only attract people that are that way. And so what happens is you can, you can get, you can, anybody can start a congregation anywhere in America now, just about, you get social media going, you get people to know you. But if you are a bitter, angry person in your heart, now I'm not talking about you, you do it publicly, but if you're that way in your heart, the only people you will attract are people who are bitter. If you are standing up and you're in hurt, you are hurt and you project that hurt with your preaching, you will attract other people that's hurt. But the reason marriages fail many times is because you get two hurt people getting engaged and walking the aisle who have never been made whole. And when they've not been made whole, they can lovey-dovey and, and, you know, I'm not going to go into details here, <laughs> honeymoons and great times, and make it, but the time will come when that hurt's going to surface in an argument and that hurt's going to surface in an argument and two hurt people can never be whole. It takes somebody whole to help somebody hurt and not somebody hurt to try to help somebody that's whole. So what happens is, and look, I've done this 45 years of traveling, Alabama, Virginia, Georgia, Tennessee. If there's anything I know, I know about denominations. I know about churches. I know how they operate. I've seen this my entire life since I was an 18 year old kid. You cannot put people together who are bitter without them eventually turning on each other. Because if you don't deal with your problem, well, it's their problem. That's your first problem right there. Your, your first problem is not taking on the responsibility for your problem. Preach, Perry. I think I will. Go ahead. You have to be responsible for yourself. I asked a friend of mine, won't name him, about another gentleman, won't name him, that got on worldwide TV and called my friend a cancer. So I asked my friend, did so-and-so 20 some years ago ever apologize for going on national TV and calling you a cancer? And my friend said, you know what? He, no, he never did. I heard he did it privately with some people on his staff, but he never did come to me. And he, this guy was so nice. He just made an excuse for him. He said, well, you know, some people just have a hard time humbling themselves if they've done something wrong and admitting they were wrong. And I looked at my friend and said, yes, it's called pride. And I know there have been people 
that I've met in my 46 years, whether it's in Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, doesn't matter, for 46 years, that I said to my wife many years ago, I said, these people, this person, hell would freeze over with icicles, literally, before they would ever say they're sorry. Because some people have never, ever been able to admit they made a mistake. Uh, did, I'm still on the phone. Don't hang up. <laughs> and the worst thing you'll ever do to yourself is do what happened to this woman. You ready to go there? Yes. 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 I need some help up in here for a minute. All right, here we go. She's getting, Naomi is getting ready to make the break, leave Moab, go back to Bethlehem, go back to the area of Judah. But she has a problem because she's got two daughter-in-laws that have no husbands, no social security, no financial benefits. The only way they're going to make it is getting married again. And she said, I'm too old to have a baby. Now, that's a, this shows you how crazy you get when you get bitter. Because if she had a baby, he'd have to be 15 to 18 before they got married, which means Ruth and Naomi would be about 50. Well, that's a real... What's that word? Gold digger? <laughs> Is that the word they use? That's a good one. I mean, you know, so, so like she's going to have kids and they're going to grow up and these women are going to sit around for 15 or 20 years to wait for these boys. I mean, look, look, people who get bitter get illogical. That's right. She's talking illogical here. So here's the two elements that I want you to see. You have one of those women that's, you know, it's about her neck. You have another one, it's about her compassion. Ruth, compassionate type person. Watch what they do to their mother-in-law. Orpah, the Bible says, kissed her, then left her. Ruth went to her and held on to her. And the King James says, he clave, she clave unto her. And she said, where you go, I go. Where you dwell, I dwell. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Now I'm going to ask you something. What's the difference between Orpah, who just kisses and runs, kiss and run, hello, and the other one who holds on and cleaves? And I'm going to give you one word that's the secret. And it's the secret why most of you here tonight are still sitting in these chairs. It's called love. Called love. Awesome. Orpa got a benefit from Naomi, but when that benefit was taken, she didn't hang around. There are people who move to this town. I'm telling you, I've learned a lot in the past year, but there are people who move to this town thinking that they were opportunists that could build their own ministries out of this place. Small group leaders who wanted their own following. And this was a great opportunity. Guaranteed congregation. All you got to do is get to know the people and you can come up with your own following. I'm getting blunt. I'm 61 and don't care. Because I want you to get the patterns. I don't want you to forget we're digging into a pattern here. So Orpah, when she saw no more seed, blessing, money, future out of that woman, she just left and didn't care. And J the Jewish Bible, my God showed me this in his Bible. And I said, that's not in the King James. He said, right there it is. And he read it to me that those giants that were born in the promised land, their mother, their daddy was Anak. It says it in the Hebrew Bible and their mother was Orpah. Orpah, mother of the giants, it's there. I preached this at Mount Olive and one of the heads of the school of theology said, that's not true and looked it up in the Bible and went and 
to, to a rabbi, he said, right there it is. And he apologized. He said, Perry, you taught me something I never knew. Ruth, however, I'm going ahead of myself. Help me, Jesus. Ruth became the, the great, 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 great grandmother. I think it's three generations of King David. So when David fought Goliath, it was a family feud. The seed of Ruth, who was the compassionate one, who said, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. You ain't leaving me in this dry land. I'm going to go where you go. I'm hanging in on this thing. She ended up producing a seed, a royal seed, and she's in the lineage of the Messiah, while the other one who decided there wasn't nothing to hang around for ended up producing giant problems and giant people and people that harassed the children of Israel. So I'm going to ask you tonight, are you a kisser or are you a cleaver? Are you going to kiss and run? Are you going to just hang out to see what benefit you can get? Then get mad and leave like some folks have? Or are you going to say, you know what? God sent me to this place. He sent me to this town. I'm going to be in every conference. I'm going to be in everything that happens. I'm going to be in the prayer meeting. You're devil, devil. You ain't running me off of my destiny. And you're not running me off of what God has. If you believe that way, put your hands together and clap and shout a praise to the Lord in this house house tonight. Yes. Woo! See, some people bail out of the boat before the ship comes in. <laughs> really, seriously. Don't do that. Don't do that. God has a plan for everybody. And let me, let me say, I bless those that may have, uh, whether it's one year, two years, five years ago, people make transitions. They go, they move, they go. Uh, we bless them. We don't say anything negative about anybody. We just bless everybody. But I, don't want, I want to talk to the people who are the Ruths. Now, here's the fact. Perry Stone, Perry Stone knows this from traveling. One third of the church are, are Naomi's. One third of the church are Orphus. Orphus. One third are Ruths. Okay. One third of the church are going to be there, be at the prayer meetings, be at the volunteer things. Just look at the numbers we've had in this building in the past, and let Pam tell you how many showed up to volunteer. It's a third. Where's my folks that's been around a while? Raise your hand. Wave it at me. Right, am I right? You run the cafeteria. But it's about a third, isn't it, that we could say are total volunteers that are always there. Yeah, a third or less, she says. Now, now stay with me on the third here, honey. Stay with me on the third. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that. But, but if they're all there, if they're all involved. Okay, so there's your Ruthites. Wherever you go, I go. What's coming up? We've got a conference. I'll be there. Prayer meeting's Thursday. Oh, my God, I don't want to miss that. What time is it? You know why? Listen to the point I'm making about Ruth. Orpha never loved Naomi. She loved Naomi's son. He's gone, no love lost. I can't go with you, sorry. I'm staying here. I'm not going. Ruth loved Naomi. I don't know what there was about her, but there was something about her that she saw destiny, even in her problem. And she says, I ain't going nowhere. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to, do you mind if I just hang on to your coattails and I'll just go over there with you? Maybe, just maybe, God has a man waiting on me. <laughs> right? right? No, she's, she knows it's not going to come from Naomi, so it's got to come from there. He, it, it's got, he does, got to come from there. So, look, the reason you continue to move in the things you do and you come here every Tuesday night. Man, I, I get so blessed. I see the weather is cold out. It is, it is Eskimo cold. And we'll have a couple hundred people in this building. I'm thinking, these are the, this, this group is the greatest group in the world. You ought to give yourself a hand. I just, said, I, I just spoke a blessing over you. This is where you pat yourself on the back and say, thank you, Jesus. I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. 
or pat your neighbor on the back and tell them they're blessed, whatever. No, no, you really are. You have become to Pam and I, and I know to Lauren and, the, and Josh and the team, you, you just are, are great people. You love Jesus. That's right. You've stayed out of the clutter. You've stayed out of people's offenses. And you've just held on to God in faith. Because, you know why? You love what God's doing. You sit here in this building and say, yeah, I remember when it got paid for. Mm-hmm. I remember when money came in and paid for this thing super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember when. I remember the prophecies. I remember what the Holy Ghost did. I remember when Warrior Fest went from 2,000 to 10,000 kids. Oh, I, and it ain't all the glory to God. Hallelujah. It's just getting started. That's the greatest part of it. And you've stayed because there's something you love. Because if you didn't love it, you'd have left it. You left it. And Naomi, let me show you Naomi, because this, we can talk about, orphan, and you know, we see her. She's just the person, she's the not involved. I'm out. Goodbye. Talk to you later. <laughs> let me go, let me go make some giant problems for you down the road. <laughs> oh, that came out like the Holy Ghost said that. <laughs> oh my God. No, she did. She created giant problems for the Israel. The giants were Israel's enemies, harassed them. Goliath taunted them for 40 days, and he, they are descendants of this woman. Oh, my goodness. Pe Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Now, here's what, let's go, if you have your Bible. Boy, that's a revelation right there, seriously. Or, Wow. Remember what I said earlier about the giants. All right. When she saw that she was steadfast, uh, I'm in verse 18. I'm sorry. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem, house of bread, came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, all the city was moved about them and said, is this Naomi? See, they haven't seen her in, I think it's 10 years roughly. She said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mera, for the Almighty hath dealt bitterly with me. All right, now that word, M-A-R-A, -A, Mera is bitter. Don't call me pleasant. That's her name. They're trying, to, they're, trying, they're trying to identify her with what she's supposed to be. And she is not allowing her identity of what God gave her to surface. And it can't surface because she says, I'm too bitter to be pleasant. I'm too bitter to be happy. Okay. Ooh. I went out full. I went out full. And the Lord hath brought me home again empty. That means the death of her husband and two sons. Why do you call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me and has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, returned and came to Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, listen to me. A third of the church world is like Ruth. And you can find that out when you go to local churches and see who's on the team, who volunteers, who comes out to the prayer meetings, who comes during the midweek service. They always said this, Sunday morning tells you. <laughs> you don't want to hear this, do you? <laughs> Sunday morning tells you how popular the church is. Sunday night tells you how, past, how, po how popular the pastor is. And Wednesday night tells you how popular Jesus is. Mm -hmm. you, that, that'll take some, that you have to meditate on that a while. That'll be, that'll be later tonight about three in the morning. Oh, you get it quickening. So one third, I can say, are like Orpa, or like Ruth in the fact that they care, they're involved. This is average. I'm just saying average. Some could be more, some could be less. Then in the body of Christ, a third are like Orpa in the fact that they're like hirelings. Remember, there's hirelings, servants, and friends. There you go, three groups. And the hireling will do anything as long as it's recognition, pay. They got a benefit. Uh, but then it says when the wolf comes, when the trouble comes, the hireling flees when it sees trouble coming. Here's the reason why. Because it doesn't care for the sheep. Real shepherds care for their sheep, see. So there we have that example again there. So we have that group, which is about a third. In other words, uh, every pastor I know, every pastor I know, 
I, I can talk about Jensen Franklin. I can talk. Tommy Bates might be the only one that never told me they never had a church split in 50 years. That's because they're all related. <laughs> Ain't nowhere to go to church up there except Tommy's church, okay? So you're going to split, you're going to have a problem. And I'm saying that jokingly. If Tommy was here, I'd say it too. But the thing is that there, there, that there is a third that will not be there because statistics show, you ready for this? This is the actual statistic. Your ministry changes people every two years. You lose 30% of the people you have. TV, doesn't matter if you're on TV, doesn't matter if it's YouTube, doesn't matter if it's a magazine. You lose 30%, two to, it's three years, I'm sorry. It used to be every seven, that went to three. You will lose 30% and you'll pick up another 30% new. We've done it all year long this past year. We picked up thousands of new partners this past year, which is amazing. And then, and really we didn't lose that many. The only ones we lost were basically people that said, financially I'm having problems because of COVID, I've lost my job. So God has been very gracious to us. Somebody put your hand up and say, thank God for grace. Thank God for his grace. I'm serious. I'm great, grateful for that. So then there's the, then there's the one third, watch this, that's bitter. Something has happened in their life that has made them bitter. They're bitter at the church. They're bitter at leadership. They're bitter at someone in the church who upset them. And they just are living in a condition of complete total bitterness. How do you get someone, and I want you to notice this now, don't take wrong what I'm about to say, but I'm saying it in all sincerity. Ruth was young, Orpah was young, Naomi was old. And do you know who will disappoint you more than anybody else in a church is the older people. They are your best blessing. Right there sits two of them. They're your best blessing. They'll be your best supporters. And if they love you, they'll stand with you. But I'm telling you, if some people get something in their attitude, you cannot believe what you have to deal with with trying to straighten out their attitude. Who am I talking to? It's quiet in the house. All this, this older bunch just died on me right there. They don't know what I've had to deal with, okay? If they knew, they'd understand what I'm saying. And so here's, my, here's the thing that's sad. Naomi should be mentoring Ruth. Yes. She should be showing her the example of faith. I lost my husband. You lost yours. We're going back to Bethlehem. God's got a plan for you, Ruth. Stay with me, baby. It's going to be okay. No. Naomi is so bitter. She's been through so much. She don't even have any faith. And it takes a young Moabite who is not a Jew, who is read your Torah Bible, is actually under a curse of 10 generations for being a Moabite to go and risk herself in a country of people that may spit on her and throw her out because I'm telling you the Jews did not care for the Moabites. Can I say this they had a racist issue I'm as serious as I can be just like they did with the Samaritans there was a racist issue going on some of it was religious some of it was not and so she shows up she's a Moabite and they say well because she's with you Ruth we'll let her stay here's what she does Boaz looked at her and said mm, I don't care if she is a Moabite and I don't care if I am a Jew that's some fine looking Moabite I'm looking at right now. read it in your Bible he got he looked at her and said whoa man that means woman in Hebrew in case you didn't know whoa man and Naomi said can she work in your field he said anytime anytime come on honey let me show you where we're going and then the Bible oh let me preach let me preach my old message here some of you will remember this and the Bible said the first thing she did was she gleaned in the field because the poor were allowed to glean in the field you know where the you know where the field the gleanings were in the corners of the field so she's over in a corner by herself doing her work nobody paying attention to her and she's coming back with a little bit of grain every day Naomi, look what I came up with. I worked real hard today and got this. And then mm, Boaz said, let's just, let's just do something for her. She's a fine worker. I like the way she works. Ah, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's just do this. Let's give her some handfuls on purpose. This is all in your Bible. So then she's out there in the field and the workers are coming by and throwing a pile of grain at her feet and running. We call it hit and run graining. That's what they're doing, hit and run graining. And so they come by and they hit 
hit it where they throw some more. And she says, oh, my goodness, where is this coming from? So it, because it's in her corner, she gets to pick it up. But can I tell you something? If you are faithful in your little corner, if you're faithful in the little things, the Bible says he's going to make you a ruler over many things. Your blessing will eventually come. Can I tell my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that it's going to come and when it's time for it to come, nobody's going to be able to stop the God factor. Nobody will be able to hinder it when God's ready to loose it and let it go when he sees you're ready for it. And I wish you'd praise the Lord one time in this house. Just one more. Just one time somebody would help me. Then, this is the greatest part. They collect the grain. It's in piles. And Boaz knows these crazy Philistines will show up and steal it at night. So he tells his guys, he said, look, I'm going to have to go out there. I'm gonna, don't you, y'all go to bed. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to lay down on my grain. I'm going to take a pillow and a blanket with me. I'm just going to lay out there. And if anybody tries to come, they're going to come over my body. And Naomi says this to Ruth. And I know this is the kind of weird parts of the Bible, perhaps. She says, uh, baby, let me tell you what to do. Take a bath. Now, this is crazy. Why do you take a bath when you're going to be laying on the floor in a grain field? Cause. Yeah, because cause mama said so. <laughs> take a bath. Put on some nice, uh, and, and anoint yourself. And by the way, the anointing oil, th th those days could be mixed with fragrances. If it was personal, right? You know that, right? So she's putting the oil on and, she's and she says, get you a fine, long skirt on. And just go out there and talk to him. So he is there. The guy is laying there and he's chilling. He's about half asleep trying to stay awake. And all of a sudden somebody, he said, who are you? It's dark. Who are you? I am the handmaiden, Ruth. And she took the bottom of her skirt and it's, you know, put, you're, that, at night it gets cool in Bethlehem. I've been there. She puts it over his feet and she just stays there with him. And he says, what a woman. And here's the, watch the part. This is the greatest part. So he becomes the kinsman redeemer, which means he can redeem all of her property back that she's lost by being gone by taking the shoe, presenting it to the elders. The elders give permission. And he ends up saying to Naomi, if you don't mind, I'd like to marry your daughter-in-law since her husband has passed. I'm a single man. Would you permit that? And she then, they then have a baby and guess who grandma is walking around with around the fields? The grandbaby. Grandma was taking care of the grandbaby. And she gets to marry, watch this, a Moabite who should not even have a future with Jewish people in that culture of that day, gets to marry the richest guy in the area. Then, then Obed is born and Jesse is born and David is born. And the giant killing king who was in the lineage who was in the lineage of the Messiah is in her bloodline and in the gospels, folks, where women are not listed in genealogies. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Therese, Therese. It's men and their son, and there's men and first son, men, and it says, and Ruth. And, and Ruth, yes. she gets listed yes. in the New Testament in the lineage of the Messiah. Come on. Come on. All because she would not get bitter. She would not let a bitter person make her bitter. Yes. See, she could have got bitter with her. Let's just get bitter together. We just have a bitter party. Bitter, bitter, bitter party. <laughs> Right? But she wouldn't let it. She guarded her heart. Yes. Now, Mama, I know things are bad, but Mama, trust me. It's going to be okay. Well, baby, you don't know what I've been through. It doesn't matter what you've been through. That's past, Mama. Will you trust me? It's going to be okay. Your God that you talked to me about in Moab, this is his land. This is his city. It's going to be okay. And every time Naomi heard a baby cry and went to that little old crib whatever it was and picked up that baby and walked around she changed her name back from Mara to Naomi 
And in the end, she's not called Mara. Not what, listen, not one place is she called that by God or the people. She called herself that. God kept calling her Naomi. Ruth kept calling her Naomi. Are you hearing me? Whew. They kept calling her when they knew her. Your name, quit calling yourself bitter. Quit living in the past. Quit bringing up junk. Quit talking about how bad. Forget it. You'll stay bitter the rest of your life. Move on. Get on with it. God has called her Naomi because he knew the reverse was coming. Now, there's three churches. There's people that just are bitter that it, unless they get over it, they're never going to get over it. There's others that are in it for what they can get, what they can build, what they can have. And when they don't have it anymore, they're gone. Then there's the third group. That's the Ruth that says, whatever God says, I will do. <laughs> whatever he speaks to me, I'll be there. Pastor, I don't know. We call you, I call you director, pastor, evangelist, teacher. I'm, just call, I'm going to call you Brother Fivefold. <laughs> I'm going to call you Brother Fivefold. <laughs> brother Fivefold. I'm going to say something. I see. Would you all bear with me? Give me I'm, 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 just a few minutes. I'm done. I promise. When I see you all on the platform, I say to my wife, Cleveland don't know what's here. They don't. They really don't. They hear their stories and their things and, and opinions. And, you know, we've been from the beginning. We were a cult from the beginning. We that somebody went on the Internet. I should have just went ahead and sued them and went on the Internet and said that Perry Stone offers sacrifices of blood to his young people in his church. Can I tell you all put the camera right here? I ain't putting up with your junk anymore. OK, just so you'll know. I've been patient and I've been kind and I've kept my mouth shut. But if you start your craziness, no more folk. No, no. Who, whoever I'm talking to, hopefully I'm talking to nobody. But if I am <laughs> starting, starting foolishness like that, craziness like that, and think I'm going to sit back and take it. No. Well, it's just the devil. Well, hello. <laughs> what about that? That's a real revelation. Hey, the light bulb just came on in somebody's head. What about it? So here we go. But if I told her, I said, the young couples that are here, when all this COVID craziness is over and people can get out and they stop their fear, which they should. Thank you. You didn't fear all of you here. There should be a hundred couples in this church with their kids. William told me just now. The resident real estate man. His phone has blown up since Sunday with people trying to move here. Yeah. Blown up. Do you know why? Because the U-Haul company said people are wanting our lifestyle that we have in Tennessee. That people are wanting a safe place to raise their kids. That people are tired of taxes and taxes and taxes and regulations and regulations and regulations. And Cleveland, Tennessee, in case you didn't hear me Sunday, has gone up number one for the number one state people are moving to in the United States, according to a U-Haul representative recently. Can you blame them? We're a great place. And I'm just telling you, one, another thing that you get to benefit from is prayer every Thursday night. Who does that? People don't do that often, do they? And you get all these conferences that you don't have to drive a million miles to get here. Amen. And you get Lauren and Sam. <laughs> and the young people get my man here and his wife. They looked great the other night. This road, the, the place was packed in the back with our young people. Man, it was great. And every now and then, I even show up to preach. Thank you all three of you on the front row that appreciate that. I, 
I don't have to do it. You know why I do it? Because I love the people that's still here. Seriously. That's why. <laughs> You've been with us through thick and thin. I'm going to be with you through your thick and thin. Okay? When hell breaks out in your family and something happens and you're up in the hospital and you said, Pam, Pam, we got an emergency, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be praying for you. Woo! And I'm going to tell you, some of you have helped me fight the devil and I'm going to help fight the devil when he shows up at your door. I'm serious. We're going to pray in the Holy Ghost till we pray, pray, all, pray all of the people into a victory realm where they need. Do y'all agree? Does anybody agree with me on that? All right, we're almost done. Put your hands up and put, put both hands up in the air. Let's begin to bless the Lord out loud. Would you, everybody? Ah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Let's pray out loud, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the men and women that are here tonight. Thank you, God, for this rows and rows and rows of young people over in this section, God, that are here tonight in this ministry, God, and for the men and women that have come out. Father, you know, the Lord told me to pray tonight. And, and just begin to pray that this COVID will break. It's time for this thing. We've put up with this long enough, haven't we? We really have. Let's pray against this. Let's pray against this. Let, I'm, I, let's just call it the plague. That's what it is. It's like a plague. Let's pray against this virus. Let's put our hands up and pray loud right now. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name on this Tuesday night in the 2nd of February. And, and you know, the, the media keeps talking about the stories and the deaths and the hospitalizations. So, Father, we're coming to you asking you for mercy. We're asking you for mercy and we're asking you for grace and we're asking you in the name of Jesus Heavenly Father that the Spirit of the Lord God is going to move and the power of the Holy Ghost is going to demonstrate the power God the, of breaking this and liberating people and setting people free. Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we come against as believers as saints of God as people that know the power of the name of Jesus as people that know the authority of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God that you God supernaturally it has to be supernatural naturally that you'll begin to defeat this virus. Uh, God, even without vaccines, uh, even without what doctors are giving people, let there be something happen that it begins to die, it begins to decline, especially, God, in our country right here. God, we need to be together. The people of God are tired of just not being able to go to their churches. Ministers are weary of not being able to preach to their congregation. So I'm asking you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to break this supernaturally and help your people, God, to turn to you, Lord, and help them not to be afraid. We break fear. We break the spirit of fear and sickness, Lord, over every man and woman and boy and girl. Hallelujah. 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 Everybody just start praying in the Holy Spirit for about, for about five minutes. Come on, loud. Everybody just lift your voice. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the King of We are living in epic times. We are the Revelation generation, and we must not hide in spiritual darkness, but must clearly understand these prophetic times and seasons. Also informing others that the last days are upon us. Perry Stone and Bill Cloud have joined together for an urgent series of new prophetic updates that are now available to you on CD or DVD. The messages included by Perry are The Hebraic Prophetic Code Concealed in the Seventh Kingdom Parables America, Epicenter of the Next Revolution The New 70-Year Prophetic Cycle and Latest End Time Signs Israel Prodigies Being Fulfilled Final Birth Pangs of the Messiah America in Crisis The Sign of Fires, the Axe, and the Tree also included in your CD or DVD set are three messages by Bill Cloud that contain amazing prophetic insight. The messages are The Beginning of Sorrows When God Hides His Face The Fight for America To receive your set of CDs, request offer number 20PS2-CD. They are available for your gift of $60 or more. To receive the DVDs, request offer number 20PS2-DVD. They are available for a gift of $80 or more. You can order online at perrystone.org or by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 
212-732-7323. You may also write to us and send a check or money order to Perry Stone Ministries, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. In this day and time, as we continue to experience biblical prophecy unfold, these timely messages are something you will want to share with your entire family and friends. We look forward to hearing from you soon.